talk a little bit about big data. Um, what, you know, and what are the kind of the attributes? Then I'm going to kind of twist a little bit and just jump into deep learning and really talk about what that's what's what's happening there. Just just a little bit to give you a feel for what really is the driver, I think, of big data today, and a, and, a, and a bit of a discussion around technology platforms. And I'm hoping at the end of today, you can see kind of the importance of big data and and where it's going, and 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 really have some concrete ideas about different approaches for how you might be able to bring it into you know and make something of it. Um, and so just, you know, I, I mean, I guess a little bit about me, I've, um, I've written three books on gaming analytics or co-authored them. I've been doing, um, artificial intelligence and big data for about 20 years. I studied artificial intelligence. I have about 270 patent applications and 26 international awards, including two Smithsonian laureates for heroism, information technology. And what might be particularly relevant is, and I was trying to figure out who had, I hadn't worked for maybe um, Galaxy, uh, but um, when MGM, Caesars, Penn, Harrah's, Hard Rock, Choctaw, Carnival, Royal Caribbean, Crown, Olive, Capri, and Sands, I've been a big part of all of their business intelligence systems. In many cases, I led the, I led the system, build out um, and, um, and probably, and I've kind of lost track, but I think maybe 200 Native American casinos on top of that as well as some pretty big initiatives down in Australia. Um, with, and, and I'm very hands-on. I, I still, despite leading these things, I'm, I'm a, I am by background a programmer and a geek. And I like to, you know, I can be seen, you know, in, in any meeting, right, or any discussion, I, I, I'm looking at source code. Um, level um, discussions often times, right? And I still write a lot of, I still write a lot of code um, despite having a team. I like to, I like, I just like to keep my hands on it. That's just a little bit about me. Um, so just, you know, what's happening in gaming, right? You know, and um, I'm, I'm working with a, a couple of really interesting projects. Like I've got one project where we have, I just found out today, we have 500 locations in Poland on one database and, and um, collecting real-time data. And, and what I'm seeing is individual handle pool data from gaming machines, individual game records from table games. I'm seeing vastly accelerated data sets in the order of a hundred times bigger than anything we've ever looked at before in gaming. And, um, and, and, and it's all coming through in real time. And that's a really big deal. The question is, you know, of course, you know, what are you going to do with it? Right. And what does it mean? It, I, I also think the other really big trend in, in gaming, and this is a, this is a central theme to big data is that the data is diversifying and, and what, you know, whereas, I don't know, um, 20 years ago when I built the data warehouse at Crown Casino. And I actually built the whole thing myself. I, you know, I did most of the coding. It was a very small team, about three people. In fact, um, halfway through the project, the key people on the team quit and, <laughs> and, and, and literally and flew to America because they, they just thought it was so impossible what we were trying to do. And that's, by the way, the first Smithsonian laureate that I won there yeah, working with Crown Casino in, in Melbourne, Australia. And, um, and and what we were working on was gaming data. That's all we could handle. And we considered it massive at the time. And today, it's not. Today, it's a small database. You know, it's a small part of the, any business intelligence system is the actual gaming data. You've, you've got social media data. You, you've, you've got email communications. You've got um, tracking data, tracking individual movements. You've got security data. You've got um, COVID-19 interaction data. There's just this massive explosion in the number of data sources. And, and um, I had the good fortune of leading a project to set up the business integration for a large Las Vegas based facility. And we counted the core systems and the core systems, there was around about 250 core systems 
I, I remember looking at the sheet and thinking, this just can't be real. You know, what is going on? It's just so much, so many sources of data. I mean, how can we, how can we deal with this? It, 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 it's, it's insane, right? Maybe it's not real. And I went through it with the CIO and we're like, okay, let's, let's, let's really, really be brutal on ourselves and make sure we've only got the things we absolutely needed. And I think we got down to 150 and we're like, wow, 150 systems to run a casino. I mean, you're talking, you know, human resources and valet and, and the system for the videos and the, in, inside the hotel and the hotel security key. And then all the different systems that are bundled from different people to run financials and everything else, just a massive number of systems. And there's value in bringing all that data together and it's growing. And, it, and what I did 20 years ago at Crown would, is, is just not acceptable in today's world. It's just not enough. Despite it being at the level where it was considered by the Smithsonian Institute to be heroic. Um, and it's just not the kind of system that we're building today. Now, before we dig into this, I'm sort of going to some more technical. I, I, I just always like how I, I saw Howard Spielman. It's absolutely wonderful presentation actually in Las Vegas. And he put up this diagram and I thought, wow, you know, this is great. I like to think about just as a tool. This is a little tool to add to your repertoire. If there's one tool to take away from today. Maybe it's this one. Whenever you think about a business problem or a set of data, these two dimensions are really important. You have data versus relationships in the data. And, and if you look at the four boxes, and this is the world that we were in 10 years ago. Mark, can you see that, my red dot? Red yes, around? absolutely. Yes. Okay. okay. We had known data and known relationships in the data. That's where we spent all of our time. That was business intelligence 20 years ago. That's what we did. And when we built systems, we typically built them to aggregate data for yesterday. And it was a massive job. If you think back to the Harris project that you and I worked on, Mark, all those years ago, where we met, I think it was 2002. Um, and that's what we were doing. We had known data and known relationships. That's it. Over today, we have unknown relationships and known data. There is piles and piles and piles of data in gaming, and we just don't know what is there. We don't understand. Someone says, why are you getting this data? I don't, we don't even know. We don't even know the attributes of the data. We don't know why it's important. So attribution is a really big deal now. And then there's also all this unknown data and we're doing tons of forecast models and predictions and trying to build relationships with unknown data. We just don't even know what the data is. And finally we have research. These four boxes are kind of like a shift in where business intelligence has moved. It started here with reporting. It moved over into unknown relationships and what you might call attribute tagging or, or, um, or something like that, or, uh, or attribution. And now it's over here, forecasting and prediction and models and artificial intelligence and reaction. This is where we are today. And, and of course, maybe the next step is research, right? Uh, just wanna, so this is a tool for you, the Spielman diagram. It's a great tool for thinking about data. And so I, I kind of, I pulled this from Wikipedia I don't suggest you read it, <laughs> can if you want, but you know, I'm not, I, I'm not going to read it to you, but you know, I, I read this earlier and I was like, wow, what is big data? And it's like, it, the truth is, the hard reality is, is that the, the entire business intelligence industry can agree on, cannot agree on what big data is. I mean, they, some people say it's because it has high speed and some people say it because it has a large size and some people say, well, it has to have both. Some people say it has to have a lot of sources. And, and then people try and say, well, it's got to be a, a, a petabyte. It's like, well, then people make petabyte systems and they go, well, that's not big enough. It's got to be 10 petabytes. It's like, okay, well, there is no definition of what it is. So it's more, it's more of an art. So it's like trying to define, answer the question. You say, what is big data? It's like saying, what is art? Well, you know, it's in the eye of the beholder, right? You know, what, what is it really? It, we, but, and, and so you have to look to examples of art and types of art and the type, if you like, to use that metaphor a little bit more as to what really big data is. And, um, and I'm going to dig into that a little bit about what, you know, what, what big data is. And there's three, 
three really important dimensions here. Volume, velocity, and variety. And I, I think these three dimensions define what is big data. So when you think about the volume, um, you think in terms of gaming, and uh, uh, you know, you're thinking about what happens if you start collecting real-time data off a gaming machine? What happens if you take the security cameras and start processing individual movements of people in the casino? What, how much is your volume going to be? What happens when you bring in the Twitter, the Twitter fire hose or the Twitter garden hose and just start getting a Twitter feed into your business? How, how is that going to relate to what's going on? And, and then the velocity, you know, how quickly does it need to be analyzed? How quickly does the decisions need to come off it? This factor is critical. And I'm going to go into this in a bit more depth, but the, this, it, this is absolutely central to defining what we're doing with big data and, and defining how we do it. And I'm going to, I, and later on in today's session, I'm going to take you through some of the technology platforms and how you really get down and how you know, the projects, some of the projects I'm working on today are using different technology platforms, but this question of how quickly you need the data, front and center, one of the hardest problems to deal with with big data, because people want to mix up real time with historic in one big bucket, and that creates a lot of challenges. And then variety, it's like, how you know, just how much data sources, and what are we going to do with all this unstructured data? How are we going to attribute it? And and one thing I could say for sure, and that is the world has become driven by this big data. I'm seeing it more and more. I'm seeing it everywhere. You know, it's the center value of business is, is the data. And I, I was um, opening a, I was contacted maybe about five years ago, what was it, eight, 10 years ago, actually. A group it asked me to come and help reopen a casino. And it was in a very competitive market in North Las Vegas. So I said, oh, sure, that sounds like fun. I'll help you reopen the casino. No, where's your customer database? And I said, oh, we don't have a customer database. I thought, well, how do you have a casino that's been open and you don't have a customer database? And it's complex, but they did not. And, and I was like, wow, this will be fun. What well, turned out that that impediment of not having a customer database made the casino valueless. It was, it was just not enough runway to get a new casino started and build a new customer database. The customer database and the casino together form the principal asset of the casino. The property without the data is valueless in that case. And, and I think, I wouldn't say valueless in all cases, but I think that the property with, with the data is so much more valuable. And we see this you know, see this time and time again, is you start adding value with data and you start wiring into the business You start thinking about, well, what does that mean? So I've got a real time system that responds to a player activity. You know, someone's someone has had a very um, big win on, on a, a Baccarat table. It's like, okay, what am I going to do in response? Is the host notified? What happens immediately? You know, they just won, you know, uh, you know, 10 million Hong Kong dollars. Okay, what happens? Okay, well, that means the data itself is now an integral part of the business process. Beyond just analytics, this is a really big shift. So 10 years ago, the casino was valueless because without its data, because 10 years ago, I couldn't get the, the, the marketing program to work. Today, the data is an integral part of the operation of the business and a key component of how, of that key component of how I relate to my customers. This is a big shift. So let's talk about volume, right? You know, and it, I have to update my graph here. It's quite funny, we run out of years, but we are growing the amount of data we collect faster than our ability to collect it. So if you look at the bottom number, the red line, that's, the number of exabytes of data. And the top line of data storage is how many, how much, how many exabytes we're collecting. The planet simply can't process the data that we're collecting. 
And I think this pattern applies at the macro and at the micro and everywhere. We are generating data and we are losing it. We are losing data. We are losing at least half of the data that's been generated has been lost simply because we've got nowhere to put it. The data volumes are just too great. And and by the way, this this statement here, the data more data has been created in the last three years than, the, than, than in the past 40,000. It doesn't matter when you do that. That's just always true. It's astonishing. And, and it's a critical part of how we operate our business. And, I, and, and I, I, I'll, I'll highlight this line here, this, this red line. I call this a, a, a sort of like the transition line in business intelligence. And I, and I remember it clearly. And you know, you know what I used to do before 2010, and what I'm doing today, right? And you know, and you guys all look pretty young, so you probably never experienced data before 2010. We used to we used to count the finest grain of data being a single line item in a transaction. That was the highest and best data we could find. Today, for every one of those lines, there's an estimated 100 thousand other lines of data in other places. A 100,000. For every financial tra transaction line item, there are 100,000 other pieces of data that you can look at. It's just, it's big. It's really big. And that's the point, right? It's big data. It's kind of a, you know, it, there's no doubt this stuff is enormous. And and so what, what's happened is we've moved from the world of transactions to the world of interactions. And I, and I, um, I, 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 I tell the story, and I'll tell it to you, I'll share it with you now. I was a, before I studied, I went to graduate school and studied artificial intelligence, I was a civil engineer. And one of the pieces of equipment that I was very proud to have been able to be qualified to use was called a, was a telescope, that, which is very specialized. It's called a theodolite or theodolite. You may never have heard them. Heard of them. Most people have never heard of them. And and so I was just on a whim, you know, thinking, oh, you know, for, for nostalgia reasons, I'd like to own a theodolite. So I was like, I went into Amazon and I started looking for theodolites. I started researching. And I'm like, well, they were like five thousand dollars. I'm like, well, you know, <laughs> I was thinking maybe I'll spend a hundred bucks. Absolutely unbelievable, expensive. So then I forgot all about it. Within 15 minutes, I was looking at my Yahoo email, which is my personal email, and up pops an ad advertising a theodolite. And I'm like, wow, what just happened? I mean, firstly, there's the privacy problem of how did they find that out, right? And I'm not going to go into that, but it's a shared advertising thing. So actually, it was Amazon's ad being placed there, but, but probably, I hope. But that's the world of digital marketing today. It's just crazy. It's incredible. It's real time. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as we go through here. Um, so the amount of variety, you know, Google, Twitter, Facebook, phones and sensors, there's just so much data and data sources and, and there's value in it. And, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll, I've got a couple of kind of a little bit of today. I'm going to touch on how we're extracting the value from that, but it is challenging. It's just, yeah, I've got 100,000 transactions. It's like, okay, so what are you going to do with that? And by the way, the people that are using it successfully are the ones that are winning. So the winners are using the data. It's like, oh, okay, well, this is a problem. If I want to be a winner, I've got to use the data. It's like, how do I get on this bandwagon? This is very challenging. We're in a very difficult time when it comes to keeping up. I was, um, I, I was working on a... Um, a neural network, artificial neural network research project. And I was trying to catch up with the latest thinking on neural networks. And, and, and there's a statistic that just blew me away. There are 50,000 research papers per day in the artificial neural network space. I mean, I don't even know that there were that many academics on the planet, but it's like, what is going on? The speed of the, is the, the depth of the movement of this industry in the world of data is absolutely astonishing. I'm going to talk a little bit more later on about why. Because something happened in 2015, the world changed in a, in a way that is going to profoundly impact everything we do for the next 
five or 10 years. So, we, and then we have all these different types, like, you know, it used to be, oh, I go to a database and I get the transactions. Well, now I've got text data and semi-structured data and graph data and social network and streaming and, oh my goodness, there is data everywhere. And then, I, and then somebody says, oh, we're going to include online finance data and the financial markets and everything else. Oh, wow. Okay. And by the way, a lot of your best customers work for companies that are publicly traded. And you can get the public traded information from the stock market about what's happening to their stock on a minute by minute basis. And they're probably interested in that and will probably change their behavior. What are you going to do? Interesting, right? It's like, wow. All of these different sources of data, this huge variety and type. And this really big problem. I mean, people say, who are your customers? Like, well, you know what? You do not own your customers anymore. You do not. Not in any way. They're everywhere. They're like, they're like in social media, they're in banking, they've got multiple casinos they're members of, they're all over the place. They the customers. And I apologize for the formatting of these. Um, you don't own them. You have a little part of a window into this big journey that they're on through the world. This idea that you've got some special relationship. So, so hold on. So you may go, well, hold on. I thought you said a database was really valuable. It is. Because the last kilometer, the last hundred meters and how that customer interacts with you, that's your data. Your interactions. So if you think about the bank, you know, banks don't own, Visa does not own their customers, but they sure do own that last little piece of information about exactly what Visa customers spend their money on. And they don't share that very easily. They share, they, share, they, they, they use it, but they don't share it. So it's, it's a really interesting twist. We don't own the customer database. We used to think that was valuable. It's like, oh, I've got a database of a million customers. Like, yeah, great. You got to have a database of a million customers and every piece of behavioral spending pattern interaction data that you can find with that customer, then you've got something valuable. All these other sources, they all add to that. You don't own it. It's like, whoa, what just happened? I've moved from the world of my customers to me sharing all of my customer database. Like, now I'm not suggesting you should go and share your customer database or the attribution because that would be a mistake. But you've got to understand that you are a part of a shared customer journey. And then the speed. I mean, I mean, 10 years ago, I used to be super happy when I could run a query on a, on a you know, on a hundred billion records and it will come back in three hours. I would be like, wow, what have I done? Today, I need to run that same query in three seconds. Like, oh, so analytics has to be fast. And, 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 and that's a really important measurement. How fast can you run a single query? It's nuts, right? The technology that we have today to, that's available to all of you right now to do this is just a, is just a ship that, or a boat that you need to get on. And, 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 and here's what I mean by that. So I don't know. Let's go back 10 years. 10 years ago, there was this database at Harris called Teradata. And, and, and it was the, it was, they spent, I think overall, they spent a billion dollars building this thing. Uh, you know, I don't know the actual number, but a lot. And, and it was incredibly fast at running an individual query. Today, you can go onto, actually onto the Teradata um, site or the Amazon site. They've all got these sites or the, or the Microsoft site or the Google site, they've all got flavors of unbelievable databases that you can either install in a hybrid cloud or a, a real cloud, depending on the technology provider, that are a hundred to a thousand times faster than what I've used 10 years ago. And a thousand times is probably an understatement, it's probably a million times. And these all of these database vendors have all gone to war with one another to find out who can make the fastest, best database that can handle this. Our job is, I mean, I'm a user of these databases. This is a, this is a ship that we need to be on and we need to just use it. You if you're using the latest, and I don't think it matters from whom, 
whomever, whichever, whichever vendor you have as your underlying database vendor or data vendor, whether it's a DynamoDB or a Teradata or, or a Microsoft, um, whomever it is, they're getting faster at a speed that is incredible. And you, we get to benefit from that. And so you can do real-time promotions. You can do real-time health monitoring. Real, we've got real-time social media feeds. We've got real-time scientific inter instruments. We've got real-time mobile devices. We've got real-time sensor networks. It's like, wow, you get the picture? It's like yesterday, last, you know, last decade, and when I mean last decade, I mean the 20, the 2010s, it was all about volume of data and processing it and getting something, you know, some analysis together. Today, it's about that same thing in 100th of the time, communicating in real time on an individual level or an individual group level. We're in a totally different world of data. It is fast and the customers expect it. They expect a fast response. They expect fast decisions. Look, why are my customers changing? I want to see my, I want to see fraud. I want to see marketing. I mean, imagine a fraud detection system that's running four days behind real time. It's like they've visited Macau, they've defrauded the, they've defrauded it, they've, le they've left and they're back in, I don't know, um, you know, I don't know, I always say country. They're back in New Zealand. I'm from New Zealand. So there we go. I can make fun of New Zealand. So they, 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 they're back in New Zealand and you can't do anything about it. They've come, they've done it and they've gone. This has to be real time. Wow, I've got to process terabytes of data in real time. It's like, yes, you bet. That's it. That's the world we're in. I'm communicating and acting and interacting with my customers in real time. Big data is just, it's just kind of like enabled all of this stuff. And I'm going to, as I said later on, I'm going to get a little bit to the how we can do this, which is super important. I want to get into it. There is another one, another V, and I think this is probably the most important one. You get all this data. It is a data mess. It is an absolute, like, you know, we used to have this well-organized financial data and well-organized customer database and everything else. Well, today we just have a mess. Getting the truth in your data is like the biggest battle you're going to have. 90% of the work that you're going to do in your database is likely to be in this last box. Veracity, the truth, getting rid of in inconsistencies and, 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 and unambiguities and Finding, you know, finding all the issues in your data. That is the hardest problem. The volume, the velocity, and the variety, you can deal with that with standard out-of-the-box tooling. The veracity, that's where it's at today. And so, you know, it's kind of a little bit about, you know, really wraps this up, you know, what happened last decade? Well, in the 2010s, we, a lot of companies were making, a few companies were making a lot of data. Lots of people consumed it. You could buy a marketing list and send out an email blast. I tell you today, that is like probably a total waste of time. It's, you know, there's not a lot in it, right? The new model, there is massive amounts of data everywhere and our value in the business is heavily associated with our ability to collect and manage our particular customer interactions. So it's not the database, it's the interactions. It's much bigger. That's the value. And everyone is consuming it. And everyone is wandering around with these mobile devices. They've got them everywhere. You, 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 you expect customers and people expect a real-time relationship with the business. And by the way, they're, they're sitting there, you know, you're communicating with them. They're also talking to the competing business. They're also watching their, their stock on the stock market. They're reading the news. They're emailing their, their girlfriend. They're keeping up with their kids. They're doing all of that. They're doing that in real time on their mobile device whilst they're sitting there, you know, probably not at the Baccarat table, but, you know, the moment they move away from it, right? And this is a, this is a total paradigm shift in what we're doing in the world of data. 100% not what I did when I started at Crown Casino. Nothing like it. This is a complete change. So what happened? What's the, and I talked a little bit about this. I want to really touch on this. Deep learning happened, and I, I mentioned earlier, you know, this, 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 some, this, this thing, deep learning, is the biggest thing to have happened in technology, and I, I think in the last 20 years. And the really, really funny thing about it 
is not what it's not sort of you know the result which is this deep learning but how long it took us to realize that it was important i'll go a little bit into that but deep learning allows us to take this massive massive volume of data and use technology to attribute it it allows us to do incredibly sophisticated and effective models and the remarkable thing about it is after you've built these models, the models themselves are very valuable and nobody can tell you why they work because they're like an indecipherable black box. They're remarkable. And so let's just took a little bit. So we've, we've got this huge world change of, of this happened, you know, the optimization and statistics and many data sources and all these things, everything is boiled down to this one thing, deep learning. If you're not doing deep learning today, you're probably losing to your competitor because of it, because they will be. It is a big deal. And, and, so, and so let's just talk about why it actually started in 2012. It's a second kind of event in 2015. I like to think of 2015 as the actual turnaround. But um, I, when I studied artificial intelligence at university, um, the neural networks were not in favor. That were not something there was no one was working on them in fact if you wrote the word neural network in your paper <laughs> thrown out they were completely and utterly disrespected they were like can't do it and and then in 2012 uh, two events happened the, the speech recognition and and this and this um and the convolutional neural network and not in that order convolutional neural network and then speech recognition and basically what they did was they took the absolute best that the human software engineers had been able to build in X years, 20 years of doing image recognition and using deep learning with neural networks that have unknown and undecipherable behavioral patterns, they went from 15.3 to 26.2. And, um, and it wiped out the market, sorry, they went, they went from they went from an error rate of 26.2 to an error rate of 15.3. This is this is dramatic. They dramatically improved how good the results were through the use of, of convolutional neural networks. Now, the really incredible thing about convolutional neural networks is today, convolutional neural networks are seen as old technology, and there's a whole bunch of new ones that are replacing them. It is absolutely impossible to keep up the rate and change of deep learning. But why did it happen? It happened because of this thing here, the, the graphics processing unit. And they basically the hardware, the graphics processing unit got big enough that you could build these huge neural networks and they simply worked. And it's brought about this absolutely astonishing change in the world. Um, I mean, AI, which, work, which is literally driven by big data is such a big trend in the world today. If you're it, 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 in a world of tech, this is it. This is like, I would say the number one, two and three biggest trends in the world, artificial intelligence. It's impacting silicon, it's impacting computers, it's impacting software, it's impacting how software is built. It's, it's, it's impacting every algorithm that's out there for doing stuff. It is absolutely astonishing how wide and how pervasive this technology is. And it's been done by very, very sophisticated people doing big data and plugging deep learning on top of it and running algorithms to get amazing results. This is going to change how we do business completely and is changing how we do business completely. And yet if you go and read them, I, mean, I get super excited about it. I read about the numbers on this stuff and I look at what's going on. And by the way, I program neural networks. I love them. I've always loved them. And, and, you know, I, I have seen some, I mean, I got, I had a little competition with a professor of computer science and he had the very, very best decision tree that you could make. He'd obviously spent years refining this decision tree approach. I got a neural network, plugged it in and I got better, better answers than he did. And, you know, and I, I wouldn't, I didn't even try. I just went, oh, look, oh, that was good. It worked. <laughs> and that's how good this stuff is. So, so the kinds of things that it does, right, is things like, um, things like categorical information. Like 
I want to categorize who's going to trend up or who's going to trend down. I want to categorize what kind of email I should send to somebody. I, I, want, to, I want to determine the amount of offer I want to give to my guests. I want to determine if somebody's about to leave the casino. I want to predict the room rate in my hotel. I want to predict when my, my, my staff are going to leave, my, uh, are going to quit and go somewhere else. Any kind of result where you have a history of what it was is an opportunity to run deep learning. And it can be done on small data sets, like I was working on the data set of 76 records. And it doesn't seem like a lot, but it was enough. And it can be done on absolutely gargantuan data sets of multi petabyte. It all works. And, um, you, you, and what, and this is kind of my job. Big data is history. Actually, big data is old news now. Is big data is like 2015. You had to get big data. Today, forget it. Today, you have to do deep learning. So if you're not on the big data bandwagon, you're already five years behind. Deep learning is where it's at today. And we're making data lakes and data swamps and cloud storage. And we're running, we're running these massive databases and we're doing real-time responses and all this stuff. And we're having speech recognition and, and chat bots and, and interactions with our customers. We're doing this with deep learning and it's happening right now. Big data, ancient history for me. It's like, when they asked me to speak on this, I'm like, okay, but I'm probably, I'm sorry, Peter, but you know, this is like old news. Like, man, you know, you got to get on the deep learning bandwagon because deep learning unlocks the value of big data. It's the key. It's the, it's the big discovery. It's like, wow, look at what we can do with all of this data mess we've got. We can use deep learning to figure it out. So the question is how? Right, and I'm going to take you through a little bit of a how on the cloud computing. I, I've um, and and I, and there's hybrid clouds. So you can run the clouds locally, and there's cloud technology. But it, it, it every, and there are regulatory constraints around clouds. And I understand that, right? So you know, and maybe it has to be a local cloud or hybrid cloud or something like that. But one of the reasons we need to look at cloud is to understand what's happening and what can be done, because the world of cloud has completely changed how we deliver software. And those things that are in the cloud, they can be delivered on property, but how we run and execute and manage and deliver software and deliver deep learning and deliver algorithms. If you wanna be on that boat, you've gotta get onto a technology platform that's at cloud level. And, 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 and there's these absolutely gargantuan companies just just out there like Microsoft which is you know a trillion dollar trillion with a T dollar company competing with Google which I think is also I mean actually can't remember I think uh, uh, Apple and Google and Microsoft and Amazon I think they're all about a, a trillion dollars now I mean these massive massive technology giants are investing enormous amounts of capital and building these unbelievable infrastructures and you will not beat it you cannot you cannot compete with this it's just not possible you can use it you can use it locally you can run hybrid clouds but this stuff is unbelievable in its sophistication its speed its rate of change and your ability to even keep up it's basically and I, and I, you know, I, I launched an educational program using artificial intelligence and um, last year and, and, and we launched it using the Microsoft Azure cloud. And, and, and it was my first coming out of gaming. It was my first big cloud experience. And I was just, my head exploded. I'm like, wow, this is so fast. We're doing iterations in a day. We're doing deep learning models. We're doing new data sources. We're managing all this thing. This thing is incredibly secure and incredibly scalable. And you just, each month, you just figure out how much money you're going to pay Microsoft, which I think is too much. But, you know, they, it's absolutely mind blowing what's going on. And let's talk a little bit how. There are types of cloud comp computing. There's public clouds. You can have your own private cloud where you can get that cloud and put it locally. There's hybrid cloud, which is super relevant in gaming, as is the private cloud, you know, where you can get a, you know, host your data locally, for example, and you maybe have to run cloud services. And 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 um, 
it's there there's and there's a community cloud so there are these different kinds of cloud it's not all like it was five years ago where it was just you know stick your stuff in the cloud now it's not like that right it doesn't work like that anymore this stuff is like gets right into your organization and becomes the wiring fabric of how you put your organization together and and and, and, and there's infrastructure as a service platform as a service software as a service but you know what this is all 2015 technology this is what we were talking about five years ago today nobody buys servers anymore right it's this is ancient news if you're thinking about getting infrastructure as a service you're probably five years behind the market unbelievable well at least platform and service you're five years behind the market so it is absolutely astonishing what's going on today with these lambda based servers and other things like that so the infrastructure of the service now all of your infrastructure is virtually deployed it's like wow no this is not happening anymore this is so 2010 right go you want to be with it you're not doing that you're doing everything is just a service whether it's storage or your database or information or you know, application processing whether it's your deep learning algorithms wherever they're running these are all services that you hook up to there's a whole vast rich array of incredibly sophisticated applications that sit on top they are on top of, of all the infrastructure you don't have to worry about infrastructure anymore not your problem in the world of cloud it's done for you and then there's these applications that are coming in and it's incredible when you go and plug in some of this technology and using it you're like wow you know, I, I just can't even believe it and and some of the key ingredients you know you've got to have is it you know is it web services in the cloud so then we get to everything as a service and my favorite one which is the lambda server which is the latest stuff um you know i want to skip straight to that you know and i i deployed a um an application a, a browser-based application on a google cloud and and it's done using a lambda server which means you know there's no server <laughs> lambda service it, 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 it's unbelievable i've written the code which is written in python I, I I go to a website or I type a command or whatever. It's deployed into the cloud. I have no idea what the hardware is. I can't even tell. There is no hardware. It just runs. When users log in, they log into the software. It runs. I have no idea what the hardware or software platform is. There's other there's other platforms like um, DynamoDB, which is one of you know. There's a few of them that are doing the same thing, competing in the space. But DynamoDB is competing in the space for single digit millisecond response times to any query on any data sites which is insane if you think about it right single digit not second which is where i was three years ago but millisecond single digit millisecond responses i mean i can't even get my network to run in single digit millisecond they can get their Dynamo DB to answer any question on any data query in single digit millisecond. Now, I actually haven't used it much, so I'm not, I'm sure that that's an exaggeration, but that's what they're talking about. And, and then you say, well, how does it work? They don't tell you. You have no idea. They do not tell you. You're just like, oh, yeah, it just works. Like, what? Where's the, where's the database? No, we're not going to tell you. Where's the storage? No, no, none of your business. Like, what? It's not how it worked 10 years ago. 10 years ago, it would have been, oh, it's running on this hardware, it's got this memory, it's got these CPUs, and blah, 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 blah. Now, forget that. It just runs. You can hook up the service, you run it. I, I've got a, um, a project that I've launched to do analysis of intellectual property using Google BigQuery, which I really love. I love the Google BigQuery. And you go into this Google BigQuery and you write these queries. And you know, for those of you who know SQL, it's a little bit like writing something that you would think would never ever end. And it runs for, it actually takes a bit of time to run all the queries I'm writing, like 20, 30 seconds. And then I'm looking at how much data. I'm like 20, 30 seconds, I'll calculate the data. Like, oh, that's processing 700 terabytes of data. Like, wow, I just wrote a query. Oh, and they charged me 50 cents to run that query. You know, I did write the query in a very clever way to reduce the cost, but you know, don't tell Google it's there. But, but what? 
I'm paying 50 cents to run a query over 700 terabytes of data. What is going on? And, and then you say to Google, oh, how does it work? They say, wow. What they say to you, it's very clever marketing. They say, oh, this is the same query in back end that, uses, that we use to run our infrastructure. Great. Okay. We do not know how this stuff works because these companies don't tell us. Unbelievable. And that's the world of today. World of today, there is no hardware. We don't even understand how things work. We're running algorithms called deep learning. We're running algorithms that are deep learning, which we don't even know why they work. On data sets that are stored in databases so big that no one will tell us how they work. And all of our competition is doing all this stuff and doing all this processing and sending these events. So they're doing everything, wants to, everything is happening in real time. It's like, uh, it's kind of like, this is a completely different world. Big data is old. Deep learning is new. Database platforms don't even exist anymore. I just use whatever they tell me to use. I don't even know how they work. Wow. So in gaming, you know, I'm, I'm pioneering this, right? I'm so excited about the potential for what you can do with real-time data and big data and deep learning and everything in data. I have, working with some of the most advanced companies on the planet doing this. It is incredible. We're going to shake up the whole industry. And by the way, it's really easy because all we need to do is go and get the latest stuff from all the latest tech providers and actually make it work. And we're probably going to be 10 years ahead of everyone else. That's our plan anyway. So um, I have, I think I was, I was going to finish at 7.15, but um, I have a little bit of time for questions. If anyone has a question, I don't know, Mark, if you have any thoughts or anything you want me to go back over, I, I'm happy to, to dig in. I'm looking to see if anybody has any questions first. Not, not seeing any questions yet. So, so I think, um, Andrew, first of all, uh, as always, uh, absolutely fascinating, uh, incredibly thought provoking and Every every time I sit down and listen to you, you give me a headache. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, be, be, because you make maybe me why think, we haven't met face to face in like five years. <laughs> no, no, it, it, it's because you always make me think in in a way that I don't normally think. In and and you 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 get the way you present things and 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 the things that you're working on are are so. Um, not only advanced, but so different that it really sort of hits you in the face and, and causes you to step back and, and re-examine what you thought was real because you realize that, well, it's not real anymore. Uh, ho however, I, I do have a question. Um, so, so obviously, you know, you need big data um, and, and you need um, these the, the cloud technology to be able to analyze the big data so you can get to deep learning. Um, but in the gaming industry with regulators that are still looking to put temper proof tape on, you know, EPROMs, how, how do we get to that point? What, what, what are the challenges that you're facing in educating regulators that, uh, you know, e even, even cloud is an issue with regulators. So how, how do you get yeah. to the point where, uh, sorry, I don't know where the database is. I don't even know what the database is. I don't even know what the hardware is. There is hardware, but God only knows where it is. How, how do you get to that point? So, so I think, um, you know, there's a couple of different aspects to this. Um, uh, you know, and where do you get to the data? So, so the first one is um, these cloud providers let you run private clouds and hybrid clouds. So, so the cloud is two things. It's a technology stack and, and it's a um, you know, deployment place. So some clouds, for example, the Google cloud, you're probably gonna be deploying your data into the cloud and you know, you're not gonna know where it is. Um, other clouds, like for example, IBM or Microsoft cloud, you can deploy it locally. And, and so, and so and, and then by the way, you can mix and match a bit. So, so, but the critical thing that's happening is not just the cloud, it's the cloud technology. So I'll, I'll give you a simple example. The, if you remember the, 
Microsoft SQL Server database that we used to joke about, right? I mean, I mean, it was hopeless. Microsoft yeah. database, in, you know, 2004 was I mean, nothing. It was was it was, it was okay, but or, you know, not not it, all the big data stuff crushed it. What Microsoft has done in Microsoft 29 is typical of what all the database vendors are doing. They are now competing head to head with Google and Amazon, and they're bringing out they're bringing out um, platforms that are so fast and, and database technology is so fast they they can be competitive. So so there is an opportunity for gaming organizations to say, okay, it, my data must remain reside in the reside in the cloud. Maybe the regulators will let me use cloud based um, AI models. It's like okay, maybe that's possible. Maybe not. Maybe I have to run them locally. But, but certainly you start with the data. And, and I, I was working with uh, one of the senior engineers at Oracle on the next generation of Oracle databases. And I'm, database, I'm trying to be agnostic here, so I'm trying to mention everyone. And he, they'd come up with a new kind of database platform. And I, and I think the, the data rate they were talking about was 500 gigabits per second of processing mm. on, per array. It's just mind-blowing and 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 they're doing that because they now have to compete with you know amazon dynamo db or google bigquery right so so it's like it's like like the, the ocean has risen and all these database vendors and just sort of give you an idea mark um in uh with microsoft sql server we, I, they used to do a new database release that was really not very consequential every two to three years they are now doing a major release every year. And this is an enormous change, right? And that's what's happening with all technology companies. In order to keep up with the speed and rate, we, we get to choose some platforms. So to specifically go to your question, there are really, really good options for how to get this latest technology into a gaming environment and, and really be running on it. But just, just understand you better be running the latest version of stuff because if you're a year behind or two years behind, you're 10x, mm. one tenth the performance you need to be. Well, I think this this was a, an absolutely fantastic presentation, and I think it really sets us up for some of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about next, which is SaaS. You, you know that cutting edge 1980s serial based <laughs> pulled technology. <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah, exactly. So, so, uh, but, but, but it, it's it's really good to see what can be done. It's really good to see what needs to be done. It's really nice to have you know the goal clearly un understood and and explained like you did. Now our job is to figure out how to get to where we are in the eighties, to you know, not twenty fifteen, not twenty twenty, but be ready for you know twenty twenty five and and beyond. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's, I mean, I'm doing, I'm working with a lot of organizations that are doing this kind of work, Mark. So it's, it's out there, right? It's not, it's not, um, it's not where it was. People, gaming organizations are using this latest tech. And, and we're, when we're going in and deploying things and seeing things, building the systems I'm building, the, the power of this stuff is absolutely incredible, right? They're like, wow, it's so fast and so flexible and so <laughs> awesome. And you're like, yeah, it's just modern, right? Yep. The, the, the tech is there to use. Any right. questions I mean, I from... A, I was in a property. I was working with one group the other day, and they're like, yeah, we'll support any database platform that's about five years old. I'm like, what? Really? Wow. You don't understand. The last five years have completely changed application servers, database servers, platforms, AI servers. I mean, the entire deep learning industry has emerged in the last five years. It's like, yeah, yeah okay. You, you know, you better be using stuff that's from today. I, um, that's exciting. It, it is very, very, very exciting. Well, um, I, I would like to thank you, Peter, and thank you, Mark, for this opportunity to talk. I, um, 
I thank you, the students, for, for the attendees here today. I, I, I really do hope I have the opportunity to meet some of you at some point in Macau. And then I hope that you're inspired to, you know, get into deep learning, I guess, and kind of, it's because it's a big opportunity, right? And I hope that you're inspired to take on big data and, and really make something of it. Andrew, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Oh, my, my great pleasure, Mark. Thank you.